Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the spring meeting of the Mountain View Historical Association. We have a different kind of a meeting today. Uh, we're going to be learning about a different part of town, and we're excited to um, present this information to you. Our presenter, researcher, and um, all things Mountain View is Mark. I mean, it's Nick Perry, sorry, Nick Perry, who is our immediate past president. Nick has written two books about the history of Mountain View. He's also a city planner and has been extraordinarily helpful in uh, detailing the history um, of Mountain View. Our other presenter later on will be Jonathan Davis, who is from the Shoreline West Association of Neighbor, Neighbors, I think that's correct. In any case, he serves on the steering committee and will give us some information about the, the neighborhood association. Uh, for those of you uh, looking at Jonathan's photo, he may look familiar. He also serves on the Parks and Rec Commission. So I will turn the program over to Nick. And there was a question in the Q&A uh, about, can we share the link to the event for family who didn't register? Um, I'm not sure what the answer is on that. Uh, the YouTube recording will be able to be shared with anyone who would like to see it. It'll be posted you know, probably in a day or so. Um, this, this is also being live streamed on Facebook right now. So anyone on Facebook, if they want to, can go to the Mount View Historical Association's Facebook page and uh, watch it from there as well. Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, Nick, your turn. All right, thank you, Pamela. Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to learn about um, some local history with us. I'm excited to share with you the history of the neighborhood that I grew up in, um, which means it's a very special place to me. So uh, it has a very rich history as one of the oldest neighborhoods in Mountain View. So I hope you'll find uh, my talk today fascinating. And I encourage you, if you have questions, um, to post them in the chat or the Q&A. And if I don't get to them during the presentation, I'll be happy to try to answer them to the best of my knowledge uh, after we finish our slideshows. Um, so I'm going to present, you know, photo history, map history, kind of city planning you focused history of both the Pacific Press, uh, the company that started basically the neighborhood that's now called Shoreline West and the evolution of the neighborhood itself. So without further ado, uh, let's get going. So early neighborhood history. Uh, this is a map of Mountain View um, in 1876. The area outlined in green is the current modern day boundaries of the neighborhood we now call the Shoreline West area. Um, you can see here in this map that uh, for those of you who aren't so familiar with Mountain View history, there is two Mountain Views, Old Mountain View and New Mountain View. Old Mountain View was the stagecoach stop town that was established right around the gold rush in the 1850s um, near where El Camino Real crosses Stevens Creek. And New Mountain View came into being in the 1860s after the railroad was built connecting San Jose to San Francisco. Um, Shoreline West is considered, I guess, historically a part of New Mountain View. Eventually the two cities, our two towns merged into one. So um, in terms of the neighborhood's early development, a lot of the land that's now Shoreline West was owned by a man named uh, Dr. Bowling Bailey. Um, and, and doctor was his first name. He was not actually a doctor. Uh, and so this map from 1889 shows the Bailey subdivision, uh, which expanded the town of New Mountain View by about 200 acres when Bailey, um, Dr. Bailey, uh, subdivided the neighborhood and bestowed the neighborhood's easternmost street with the family surname, um, Bailey Avenue. So the road extended at that time from El Camino Real on the south to the railroad tracks on the north. Uh, the area south of California Street was resubdivided into 8,000 square foot lots in 1888. Um, this map notes that area as the Snow Pettis uh, subdivision. Uh, the area north of California Street was redivided into smaller parcels around 1905. That's the Bailey subdivision. One of the first uh, buildings in the neighborhood was a cannery. Um, it was called the Mountain View Canning Company originally. It was open in the 1890s on Bailey Avenue at the railroad tracks. And sneak preview of what I'll talk about later, Bailey Avenue is now known as Shoreline Boulevard if you're confused by the name. Um, the cannery employed about 75 to 80 people during the cherry season in the 1880s. It was later purchased by the Sanguinetti family, and many years later, it became part of the Richmond Chase Canning Company. So it was a presence there on Villa and Bailey at the railroad tracks for, over, for almost a century. 
Um, this kind of gives you a glimpse of what the outskirts of the neighborhood looked like uh, back around the turn of the century. This is the intersection of California Street and Mariposa Avenue around 1900. Uh, the photographer would be standing behind the California Street Market for those of you who are familiar with uh, the neighborhood. Uh, so Mountain View, when the city officially incorporated it in 1902, the original town limits were on the back side of the lots running Pettis Avenue. Um, beyond the city limits was this area, it was known as the Buena Vista Tract. It was about 61 acres that was subdivided by a real estate developer known as named Walter Clark in 1904. Uh, parcels were originally one acre in size. Electricity and telephone was optional, but water was provided, so you didn't have tank houses like you would in a lot of neighborhoods back then. Um, the area was marketed as a place to have a country house, you know, just outside of town. And the first homes that were built were large but modest Victorians like the ones you see here um, in this picture. And we'll talk more about these two houses at the end of the presentation. Um, all houses had to cost at least $1,000. Um, no liquor could be sold on any of the parcels. And barns, wood piles, and laundries were prohibited. And there's some probably, there's uh, some institutionalized racism, or for lack of a better term there, with the laundries probably trying to prohibit Chinese people from locating in this neighborhood um, because of the discrimination that happened at that time. Um, so big changes came around the turn of the century, a couple of years after that photo I just showed uh, took place, and that's largely because of the Pacific Press. So a bit about the Pacific Press and the church. Uh, so the Seventh-day Adventist Church um, is an Adventist Protestant Christian denomination that was formally established in Battle Creek, Michigan on May 21st, 1863, with a membership of 3,500 people. Uh, James and Ellen White, pictured here, were two of the co-founders of the church. Um, in 1874, Pacific Press established, was established in Oakland uh, by James White, and it published religious materials, but its main income came through its commercial printing business. So this photo, um, sepia tone photo, on the right is a photo of the Pacific Press in Oakland circa 1885. Um, in 1904, uh, James and Ellen White were married. Uh, Ellen uh, suggested or decided that it'd be best to relocate the Pacific Press to a more rural environment. Uh, and the recently established city government of Mountain View offered the press five acres of land on Villa Street. Um, at the time, she wrote about Mountain View in one of the press's publications. And I'll just read what she wrote about our town back then. She said, a mountain View is a town which has many advantages. It is surrounded by beautiful orchards. The climate is mild and fruit and vegetables of all kinds can be grown. The town is not large, yet it has electric lights, mail carriers, and many other advantages usually only seen in cities. Some have wondered why our office of publication should be moved from Oakland to Mountain View. God has been calling upon his people to leave the cities. The youth who are connected with our institutions should not be exposed to the temptation and the corruption to be found in large cities. Mountain View has seemed to be a favorable location for the printing office. So they decamped from turn of the century Oakland to pastoral Mountain View. Uh, so here we see the Pacific Press under construction um, around 1904. It was a 60,000 square foot building. It cost about $40,000. If someone wants to go on Google and do the math about what that would be now, I'd, I'd welcome that. I, don't, I forgot to do that. Um, in terms of where we're looking here, so this back here, if you're following the pointer, which hopefully is showing up, is the railroad tracks. The Pacific Crest plant would be facing Villa Street, which is just to the right of the photo frame. And then in the background, you can see the cannery that I showed a picture of earlier. Uh, about 100 Seventh-day Adventist families relocated to Mountain View to work at the press and built up the neighborhood just to the south of the plant, Charline West. Uh, Mountain View's population back then was around 600 people. So you can imagine how the sudden influx of 100 families dramatically changed the town. Um, by 1910, the population of the town of Mountain View had grown to about 1,161 people, according to the 1910 census. Uh, disaster struck soon after the press relocated to Mountain View. You've all probably heard about the great earthquake of 1906, April 18th, 1906, the great San Francisco quake. Um, it affected much more than San Francisco. Uh, at the Pacific Press, three walls of the press collapsed. The smokestack fell through the roof. Uh, nobody was injured, um, and the press was immediately able to resume operation, uh, but damages were estimated to have cost twenty to $25,000. $25, um, and it was not the only building in Mountain View that was damaged by the earthquake. Um, six brick structures, including the Pacific Press, were seriously damaged. Um, nobody 
died though in that movie from the earthquake. Uh, even though they were able to rebuild the press, uh, disaster struck again, same year, July 20th. Um, after earthquake repairs were completed, the a fire broke out in the press's engraving department um, and it was put out the next night, but it destroyed the entire plant. Uh, the city had not complied with the request to place a fire hydrant near the building and the nearest hydrant was 700 feet away and the longest hose was 675 feet long. So the plant burned down at a loss of $200,000 and leaders of the, the community, the Adventist and press community, saw it as a sign potentially to cease commercial publication um, at the press, which was had long been advocated by one of their founders, by Ellen White. Um, can someone in the chat let me know if my connection is okay? I just got an internet connection unstable. Are you all able to hear me okay? Someone tell me yes or no. Okay, thank you, folks. All right, if I if I broke up, break up for a bit, let me know and I'll I'll revisit that. Thank you. All right, let's keep going. Uh, so this is the uh, new press plant that was built after fire destroyed the original one. Um, it was a much more modest structure, but it served its purpose as well. Uh, here we see an artistic uh, rendering of the plant in full operation with carriages coming up to the front and the smokestack billowing and the countryside of Mountain View visible in the background. Uh, in 1907, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was built on the corner of Bailey Avenue and West Dana Street. Uh, prior to that, the church services had been held in the Pacific Press Auditorium. And so here we see a view of the neighborhood around 1909. So here is Bailey Avenue, now Shoreline Boulevard. Here's Villa Street, uh, the press, the 1907 press building you can see here. Uh, this is a boarding house for women working at the press, this building. And then there's the cannery that I mentioned earlier. And you can see the growing neighborhood of bungalows uh, forming just to the south of the Pacific Press. Uh, the Pacific Press was viewed as a pillar of the community. Um, from the 1906 earthquake on, the press consistently had representation in local government. And I should uh, give credit to what I'm about to say to Mary Jo Ignofo in her book, Milestones of History Mountain View. This is a quote from it. Um, At least one person associated with the Pacific Press and the Adventist Church served on the Mountain View City Council for the next five decades. Um, the Adventists remained a distinct group with homes clustered west of Castro Street near the publishing plant. They had there an elementary school in 1906, a high school beginning in 1918, Mountain View Academy, um, and it still remains there on Shoreline Boulevard. And this is a photo of the Pacific Press Orchestra from around the turn of the century. Um, Mountain View was rightfully proud of the Pacific Press. You know, this is an era of boosterism. This is a newspaper cartoon from the Mountain View town paper in the 1920s. Um, it has various paintbrushes that these uh, painters are using to put Mountain View on the map. And you can see that Pacific Press is one of the paintbrushes that has helped put Mountain View on the map in addition to some other um, mostly agriculturally related industries. Uh, so by the 1920s, this is a Sanborn fire insurance map. It shows how built up the neighborhood had become. Uh, you see the more densely developed area that is a part of the Bailey subdivision uh, east of Pettis Avenue and then the more uh, one acre lot, countryside, kind of outside of town, Buena Vista tract uh, west of Pettis Avenue. And the plant is shown here in, in blue, as well as the cannery in blue. Houses are yellow and the school um, in purple and the church in purple and a couple and a grocery store, which is now a house on Villa Street. Um, I like the zoomed in version of the press campus from back in 1921. Uh, if you look closely, you can see that there's an assembly hall a gymnasium, a bathhouse, in addition to all the press functions. It's like the great, great grandfather of Mountain View's modern tech campuses, which is fitting given the building's current use, which I'll talk about soon. Uh, so here is an aerial photo from the UCLA photo archives that I love of Mountain View in 1931. Um, and so, you know, picture the scene here. It's a small agricultural town surrounded by orchards and farms. The biggest built up part of it is the neighborhood directly south of the Pacific Press Campus. So Castro Street is right around here downtown, what we now call Old Mountain View. A lot of it was still just farmland, but then you see the Shoreline West neighborhood mostly built up with the press right there. Um, and like most Valley cities at the time, Mountain View's economy was largely driven by agriculture, uh, but the P 
Pacific Press stood out as one of the first industrial operations in the area. Um, and it made Mountain View more of a, I guess, well-rounded city and that it didn't have just one industry driving it. Um, things began to change a few years later after that photo was taken with the establishment of Naval Air Station Moffett Field, um, turning Mountain View into a Navy town, um, and the Ames Research Center in 1939, which began the Valley shift to technology, uh, but much bigger changes were on the horizon. So now I'll talk about the next phase of the neighborhood's history, the post-war boom years. Uh, but before that, I want to share one image that is a unique story connected to the Adventist community in Mountain View. Um, according to Mary Jo Ignofo, uh, from who I mentioned earlier, wrote Milestones of History of Mountain View. Um, this is a photo of Japanese internment, um, the Mountain View Japanese population being uh, evacuated out of Mountain View at the Mountain View train depot um, during World War II. So I'll just read what Mary Jo wrote. Um, a few local fa Japanese families were spirited away to Utah by local Adventist sponsors. Apparently, the Mountain View Seventh-day Adventist church members, because of their pacifist beliefs, searched out and found Mormons living on Utah ranches to host Japanese families. Some Japanese evacuees spent the duration of the war working on private ranches that, instead of government-run internment camps. One beneficiary of this church plan was Dorothy Kobayashi. She said, we didn't go to camp. My parents pulled us out of school one day. We left everything in charge of the two steady Filipino workers, Batista and Abayone, they were instructed to finish the harvest and take care of the ranch. They saved, they stayed for four years. Uh, Dorothy's family found that their property was intact when they were returned. One of the few families that got to go back to their homes as it was um, before the internment. So um, a dark portion of Mountain View history, but a silver lining that the Adventist community worked to have some of the Japanese families have a better situation than many others faced. Um, switching gears uh, around 1948, uh, the Pacific Press was remodeled with a Spanish mission architectural style, um, as it looks today. A new auditorium building was constructed, which is visible on the right of this postcard. Um, this image was donated to us by Jim Peterson, whose father worked at uh, Pacific Press from 1948 till 1972. Um, and here we just see the neighborhood as it was right around 1950. Uh, you see the auditorium I just mentioned, the press campus, the luxurious landscaping with palm trees and lawns, the boarding house that you saw earlier. Uh, here is Miramonte School, the elementary school for the Adventist community. Um, the cannery is still there, uh, right there. And also, um, I don't have a modern photo of this. I wish I had taken it before they got knocked down, but there used to be a large complex of cannery worker houses uh, right on the corner of Mountain View and Villa Street called the Rose Court Cottages, uh, kind of like the immigrant house. Uh, if you go to Heritage Park in Mountain View, something similar to that. And they were there until the 90s. Um, just everyone knows the Silicon Valley boom happens after the war in the 50s. Uh, Shockley Semiconductor, the first semiconductor based uh, industrial lab in the valley on San Antonio Road in Mountain View, leading to the birth of Fairchild and countless companies, and the city boomed. So I've shown this image many times, but I always like to emphasize you know, you have here 1950, a town of 6,000 going up to 30,000 in 1960 and 54,000 by 1970. So we think the changes that we've seen over the past decade are a lot. It doesn't compare to what happened in the two decades after the war. And that changed the neighborhood. So uh, the Shoreline West neighborhood went from being one of the only neighborhoods in Mountain View at the edge of town, surrounded by orchards, to being right in the middle of Mountain View and the countryside that had once surrounded it rapidly disappeared. Um, Mountain View did not neglect the older neighborhoods though. I, well, they, they had ideas for the neighborhoods that they wanted to see evolve as the city began to grow. Uh, this is Mountain View's planning director, uh, Robert Lawrence. He was the director from 1962 to 1975. Uh, they rezoned most of old Mountain View and Shoreline West to high density. Um, the idea was that lots would be combined, apartment complexes would be built, um, apartment towers actually between uh, Bailey, Shoreline, and Castro, like up to 75 feet tall. So if you zoom in on this map, you can see what the land use designations were around then. So you see the Shoreline West area is all zoned for three-story apartment buildings, and then the area between Castro and uh, Bailey was zoned for seven-story tall apartment complexes. Um, so what ended up happening was uh, things didn't go quite according to plan. This is a newspaper article from 1962. 
showing a situation on Pettis Avenue. You see one of the old bungalows next to a brand new apartment building. Um, a lot of people decided to take advantage of the new zoning by building apartments in their backyard um, instead of combining lots and building modern apartment buildings. It kind of we had all these narrow, skinny apartment buildings that happened in people's backyards in the neighborhood. And you know, I thought you know, growing up in the neighborhood, that's great. It ended, it added to like people of all incomes and backgrounds could afford to live in the neighborhood. But at the time, the city was like, ah, this isn't what we wanted. We thought that all these old houses would get knocked down and we'd have nice, modern, large apartment complexes, not the small ones that existed. Um, at the same time, as the neighborhood changed and the city around it grew, uh, the streets that ran through it needed to be improved. Uh, so this is a before photo of California Street. It was a two lane rural road, you know, not even paved sidewalks back in the 1960s. Um, and the big story from that era is uh, Bailey Avenue, which I mentioned earlier. So Bailey Avenue was two lane road, 60 feet wide, you know, not too different from Palo Alto Avenue or Mariposa Avenue or any of the other neighborhood streets that exist today. Uh, but the city uh, decided that it needed to be widened um, because it was one of the few roads that really crossed the railroad tracks and was a north south connection. So a new overpass. Uh, carrying traffic over the railroad and central expressway plus the, a new curved segment of Bailey Avenue that connected it with Sterling Road created what is now known as Shoreline Boulevard. It wasn't renamed Shoreline until the 80s. Um, in 1973, the contractor who built the new Bailey Avenue actually received a landscape architecture award from President Nixon at the White House. Uh, so they were quite proud of the street design back then. Um, this image, you can see what they did was the old, the original Bailey Avenue is still there. That's basically now the southbound uh, travel lanes and the northbound travel lanes wiped out all the homes that had faced Bailey. Um, my own family's history in the neighborhood is uh, tied to this era. Uh, Bailey Avenue's widening required the removal of dozens of homes in eminent domain, displacing 115 families, uh, most of whom were Hispanic. Uh, the backyards of the homes that once stood on Bailey are still visible today as those lots, one of which is the Latham Community Garden. Um, the fate of those lots helped spur Shoreline West and that association's uh, formation, which we'll hear about later from Jonathan. Um, for my own family story, uh, you may have, some of you who know me, you probably have heard this before, but my family, my grandparents, and lived in the Mexican-American community on Washington Street. Uh, their house and the house of their neighbors and relatives were all taken via eminent domain. Uh, they couldn't find another house to have their family uh, live in in Mountain View, so they actually bought their house back from the county, relocated it down Bailey, down Villa, and on to Pettis, um, where it still stands today, and that's where I grew up, um, and that's what brought us to the Shoreline West neighborhood. Um, so just some Im images of that time period. Uh, here's a view of basically where the overpass is now, uh, a big hole. Uh, if you're familiar with the neighborhood, you probably recognize this house and its palm tree. It looks almost exactly the same today. Uh, in the distance, you can see the Adventist church is still standing there. Um, and yeah, just the dramatic uh, scar, basically, that the widening put through the neighborhood. Uh, here's a picture of that same view uh, after the overpass was built and constructed. Um, and here's a picture of the intersection of Bailey and West Dana. And you get a better view of the Adventist church on the corner there. Um, so, you know, as Mountain View changed, uh, the Pacific Press and the Adventist community also changed. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church relocated in 1967 to an area in Southern Mountain View, actually uh, in Los Altos. And because of the church's deep ties to Mountain View, uh, the church petitioned both the city councils of Mountain View and Los Altos to shift the city limits, because it was right on the edge between the two cities, shift the limits so that the parcel that they relocated to would be in Mountain View and not Los Altos. And miraculously, both cities agreed. And so that's why the Adventist church is still in Mountain View, even though it was originally in Los Altos, the boundary moved, not the church. Not originally, but after it moved from the Sterling West. Um, the elementary school also relocated in 1972 into Los Altos. And then in 1983, the Pacific Press uh, decided to relocate to Nampa, Idaho. Um, at the time, it employed 250 people. The relocation uh, took place in 1984 and 1985. 
Um, kind of similar for why they moved from Oakland to Mountain View. They wanted to be in a more rural environment. In this case, cost of living, even back in the 80s, was a factor. And that's why they relocated to Idaho. Um, the property was converted uh, by South Bay Construction and Development Company into offices uh, that were initially occupied by Hewlett Packard. Um, the Mountain View Academy, the high school, remained probably the most prominent link to the neighborhood Seventh-day Adventist Pacific Press origins. Uh, here's a picture of the school, main school building, as it looked around 1949 on West Dana Street. Uh, in 1950, a gym was added to that, which faced uh, Mountain View Avenue. Um, in 1970, October 22nd, a fire destroyed that gym that I mentioned. It had uh, believed it was believed to. Oh, I'm glitching. Am I okay now? Thank you. Um, so a fire believed to have been caused by an arson destroyed the gym in 1970, and about six months later. Uh, the old church, which was then used as the high school's chapel, also burnt down on April 18th, 1971, and that was believed to have been caused by a uh, faulty heater or gas furnace. Uh, both buildings were completely destroyed. Uh, so here we see, using Sanborn maps, the evolution of the block that Mountain View Academy was on. Uh, back in 1908, you see the church on the corner, the little school building, and the rest of the block is occupied by houses shown in yellow. And then as the decades go on, the school just grows and grows, and then the church burns down, um, and the new campus, the buildings that kind of look like, I think, like Foothill College a little bit, um, kind of take over most of the block. And there are still two houses on the block, and they're pictured here as they look today. And I believe the, the school is thinking of building, still thinking of building a teacher housing there, but I don't know the current status of that. So if anyone else does, please feel free to share. Um, I mentioned the city not being quite pleased with how the rezoning worked and the apartments being built in uh, backyards. Uh, so they decided to reverse course in 1977. There was a central city area plan rezoning where they're basically like, yeah, we don't like this. It's not turning out how we like. So everything was basically down zoned uh, back to single family housing or for duplexes or for limit more limited um, apartments. So that kind of brought the neighborhood back to uh, a zoning that matched most of its existing housing stock, which is mostly turn of the century bungalows. Um, and one final lasting link uh, to Pacific Press I wanted to mention, I've mentioned Mary Jo Gnofo's book. It's now 20 years old, so it needs a refresher, but uh, Pacific Press actually published the book for the Mountain View Historical Association back during the city of Mountain View centennial in 2002. So kind of a cool link that, you know, even though they're not uh, located here anymore, they they still published our town's uh, definitive history book. Um, so now I'm just going to talk about some neighborhood landmarks then and now, and I'll preface this by saying that uh, this is mostly focused on buildings north of California Street, and that's mainly because we have more historic photos of those buildings, but there are equal amounts of fascinating buildings on the south side of California. I just don't have photos to share, so apologies for those of you living in that side of the neighborhood. Um, but first, this map, uh, this is from the city's historic resource survey that took place back in 2007, and it color codes the age of the building stock in Mountain View. Um, and you can see the Shoreline West neighborhood outlined in red, um, and just how, compared to the rest of Mountain View, how much older it is than the rest of Mountain View. It's probably one of the biggest clusters of pre-war, pre-World War II um, development in the city that still exists. So first, then, and now. Um, here's another photo of the 1907 Pacific Press uh, plant on Villa Street. Uh, here's how that same building looked after it was remodeled in 1948 into the mission style. Um, and here is how it looked around 2011, uh, pretty much as it did back in 1948. And then here is a picture more recently taken of the fountain on Villa Street, which was added when they converted the press to offices. Um, in the Asari state now, uh, the building complex was purchased by Google in, uh, I forget what year, but recently. Um, and it's, I think, being remodeled right now. Last time I was walking around there, I'm not quite sure what's going on. But you can see in the photo on the left, the auditorium building is still standing. Um, and for many, many years, there was a plaque right next to the fountain that noted the history of the site. But at some point, it got ripped off um, and it doesn't, it's not there anymore. But maybe the historical association should put one back when we have some time. 
Um, here's another series of photos that show the auditorium building and uh, some of the you know, mementos of Pacific Crest that were saved when they converted it. So you can still see the, the seal on the auditorium building entrance. And there's some, at least last time I was back there, wrought iron fencing that has the Pacific Crest logo um, on the complex. Um, another then and now, this is a house uh, at 340 Palo Alto Avenue. Um, it was originally purchased by the Adventist Reverend Hampton Cottrell, um, the longtime home of the uh, Stover family, one of the larger homes in the neighborhood. Uh, and here's how it looked circa 2001. And here's how it looks today. Um, there was controversy around this home, which I was involved in as a younger person when Mountain View was doing its historic preservation ordinance. The owners at the time wanted to demolish this house to build accessible housing. Uh, the house was preserved though, and they converted the house into, they made it accessible by remodeling it instead. Um, another historic home is 201 Mariposa Avenue. Um, it's known as the Klein home, and I'll tell the story of the Klein family because it's kind of fascinating. Um, Pierre and Victorine Klein were immigrants from the Alsace region between France and Germany. They first settled in Idaho and then, uh, Ohio and then came to San Francisco in the 1870s. They purchased 160 acres of land on Montebello Ridge, uh, south of Mountain View up in the Santa Cruz Mountain foothills and established a winery. And by the turn of the century, Pierre had achieved fame as one of California's greatest winemakers um, with his Miravalle or Valley wines, winning awards at the Paris Exposition of 1900 and the Buffalo Exposition of 1901. Uh, Pierre shifted into retirement around 1904 and briefly served as Mountain View's town marshal. Um, his wife's Victorine's sudden death in 1919 from pancreatic cancer devastated him, um, but he poured himself into working with his son, who was a carpenter, also named Pierre, um, to building this house at 201 Mariposa uh, for his daughter, who was also named Victorine. Uh, the house was uh, described in a local newspaper as one of the niftiest little bungalows now in the course of erection. Um, Pierre's health, however, declined rapidly, and uh, sadly, he uh, died from suicide in the garage of 201 Mariposa in 1922. Um, his daughter, Victorine, was a beloved teacher uh, for decades in Mountain View. She taught at the Highway Elementary School on El Camino Real and Calderon from 1902 to 1916, and they became vice principal of the new Dana Street School in 1916, and she retired in uh, 1934. Uh, one week before her death in 1958, the school district voted to name a new school being constructed at the corner of Ortega and California streets after her. Uh, the school opened in 1966 and had a really innovative educational approach, which I don't fully understand, but it involved um, not having graded classrooms, basically. Um, the school only operated for about a decade. The property was sold to a housing developer and torn down in 1987. Uh, the city purchased one acre of the school and established Klein Park, and there's a plaque um, at the park uh, that denotes Victorine's Klein School and, and the, the woman herself. Um, so here's a picture of the Klein home in 1977, when I believe it was home to the Peterson family, who I mentioned donated some images to us. Uh, and Carol just asks, is that the photo of Victorine, the mother or the daughter? I believe that's the daughter, but I should double check that. I got confused myself about the multiple names from the family. Um, and here's the photo of the house today, looking much as it did back in the 1920s. Uh, another house that is worth noting is the house at 336 Mariposa Avenue. Um, here's a photo of it from the 1920s. It was built by uh, Wilbur Camp, who was a prominent early leader in uh, Mountain View's history. So he, uh, Wilbur was a veteran of the Spanish-American War in the Philippines, and he moved to California. In 1905, here's a photo of the house as it looks today. It has been heavily remodeled. Um, Camp helped establish the Farmers and Merchants Bank building on Castro Street, or the bank on Castro Street, um, longtime home of the Red Rock Coffee Company. Um, so here is a photo of the interior of the bank, and I believe Camp is the man who's leaning uh, against the side of the desk here. Um, he worked at the bank until 1940. By that time, it was a branch of the Bank of America. Uh, another building that is interesting to note is 1560 California Street. I um, mean, we saw this image earlier showing the intersection of Mariposa and California Street. Uh, this house was built around the turn of the century as a part of the Buena Vista tract. But what's neat about it is that it was a, the original home of, the, of Mountain View's Community School of Music and Arts, which was founded in 1968. 
um, and some history from the art school's blog. Uh, this is from a quote from Natalie Werbner, the co-founder of the Community School of Music and Arts. Um, so she said, that after getting a degree in music from Boston University, I moved to Palo Alto for a job as an art therapist and began looking for a place to start a school in this area. I had heard that Mountain View had a mix of people with high and low incomes, which was important to me. The city of Mountain View at that time was buying houses as they came on the market and renting them at low cost. We went through hearings and got community agreement to open a school in one of these houses. We used the backyard to hold classes. I think our rent was only 25 because we were doing something for the people. The city helped us in every way possible because the city welcomed us. That's why we are here. Um, the school eventually relocated to the shuttered campus of Klein Elementary School and then to the shuttered campus of Huff Elementary School, now Amy Amai Elementary School. And finally, in 2004, to its current location, the award-winning Finn Center on San Antonio Circle. Uh, and here's a picture of the house today. Um, another house that's one of the older homes in the neighborhood is 1610 California Street. Um, not too much interesting about this house other than it's old, but I will say that it was probably built for Stuart, Stuart and Susie McCormick around 1900. Um, it was occupied by the Jones family from 1914 to 1920. Uh, they were Welsh immigrants um, and they worked at Pacific Press. Um, and let's see, the McCormicks moved back in 1931. Oh, and Betsy Collard is correcting me. The first location of the CSMA, the Community School of Music and of Arts, was originally Bailey and then California. I was wondering about that. Thanks, Betsy. I got that wrong and I appreciate the info. Um, and anyway, this house was divided into apartments in the 1930s. Uh, here is another picture of the house from 1977. And here's a couple photos of it today. Um, and then one more, uh, then and now, uh, this is a grocery store originally that was located at 300, 320 Mountain View Avenue, right across from the high school, Mountain View Academy. Um, built sometime in the 1920s, the was known as Wagner's Grocery in 1938 and Mitchell's Grocery in 1949. Uh, for many years, from what I remember, it was owned by a former Mr. Universe who lived in the house next door and operated a weight equipment shop out of the storefront. Um, and more recently, it's become home to the Mountain View Candle Company that has like classes there and events and makes candles. So check that out if you haven't been in the neighborhood in a while. And then I will finish my then and now with a, a pretty cool site, the Mariposa Park site. Um, so this parcel, which is now Mariposa Park, was purchased around 1904 by Manuel Francis, a Portuguese immigrant. He sold it to Margaret Donovan in 1910, who built the small Victorian house that you see pictured on the lower left at 303 Mariposa Avenue and the barn, which used to stand at 1565 West Dana Street. Um, and she lived there with her daughter, Mary, um, until her death in 1954. Um, before her death, Mary subdivided the parcel and sold portions of it to the Rasmussen family, who converted the barn into a printing house. Uh, the Rasmussens were members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, so these pictures show uh, basically then and now of what the park looked like um, before construction and then during construction. Um, I can't believe it, but Mariposa Park is turning 10 years old in June. Uh, so I grew up literally like next door to where Mariposa Park is, or uh, well, my neighbors grew up next door. Anyway, I grew up on West Dana Street, um, and it was really fun to be part of the planning process. I will say initially our family was not uh, supportive of the park because we were sad to see all our neighbors get evicted and we're hoping that the city could you know close a portion of dana street and build the park there instead but once the decision was made we embraced it and got involved and had a lot of fun with our neighbors uh, and people at the time in the landscape architect uh, making the park a really special place that celebrates the neighborhood's character and history um, so one of my favorite features of the park which I helped do uh, through my volunteer work with the Mountain View Historical Association back then, are the, uh, the historical placards that on one side, the landscape architects kind of chronicle the life cycle of a butterfly, and on the other side uh, is a chronicling of the neighborhood's evolution, which I helped put together. And it was really cool to be able to put the neighborhood's history out there for people to see in a public way. And that's kind of what the Mountain View Historical Association wants to do more of. Um, and this photo is from the day the park opened. Uh, with my grandma, uh, who was being uh, pushed in her wheelchair by a neighbor um, as one of my cousin's kids and a neighbor's kid look at the historical signs. So 
just a nice memory. And it's nice that even though my family uh, doesn't live in the neighborhood anymore, we can go back to Mariposa Park and uh, you know, feel at home there. And, uh, and tomorrow we'll be there to help celebrate Shoreline West Association of Neighbors annual ice cream so social. So looking forward to that. And I think that's the perfect segue for me to turn the presentation over to Jonathan to talk more about Shoreline West. So Jonathan, I'm done. The floor is yours. Great. Um, thank you so much, Nick. Thank you for sharing that uh, really interesting history. It's um, interesting and very instructive uh, who we are, where we came from, and how communities change. So uh, I really uh, applaud your scholarship and, and appreciate your sharing it with us. I'm hoping everybody can uh, see my screen. I'll give it just a couple minutes here on the Neighborhood Association. <clears throat> um, if I can get this to... So uh, Nick showed this uh, photo or similar photo of Bailey Avenue, which is now Shoreline Boulevard. And I include this really just to say that um, I think there's been a, a long history of uh, resident activism in the uh, local community here that preceded uh, the Shoreline West Association of Neighbors group. There have been various other groups that have formed around things such as the um, evolving transportation infrastructure and, and those changes in the city. Um, I pick up uh, involvement uh, very recently as a kind of the junior member of the uh, Shoreline West Association of uh, Neighbor Steering Committee. Um, start your video. Okay, I got a little zoom notice there. Um, the Swan As Association was uh, established in 1994, and it's one of the groups that the City of Mountain View recognizes through the uh, Community Development uh, Department and uh, the department which helps uh, organize and facilitate uh, neighborhood activity. We're fortunate to receive an annual grant from the city to help us with our community activities. Sorry, this is jumping around a little on me. The uh, current boundaries of the Shoreline West Association of Neighbors is El Camino on the south side, Escuela Avenue on the uh, northwest, and Villa Avenue are really the development up to the train tracks on the north side, and of course, Shoreline Boulevard uh, on the east. So that uh, everything encompassed in that is our uh, neighborhood association. And we really serve uh, the neighborhood interests and to reinforce a common identity for the community. Um, we serve as a vehicle for advocacy on some issues, but really strengthen to uh, serve to strengthen the neighborhood identity through events, um, through gatherings, and by disseminating information relevant to our neighbors. This is a list of the typical annual slate of activities that the SWAN uh, steering committee organizes and holds with the community. Um, we have regular gatherings in Mariposa Park. Um, Silly in the Street is a, a brand affiliated with the Swan Group and uh, also produces, coordinates block party events for primarily for family and uh, kids' activities, chalk art, uh, various games, and, and refreshments for kids. Um, similarly, and often associated with the Silly in the Streets are neighborhood kids' marketplaces where uh, children can sell their art projects, plants, uh, lemonade, refreshments, things like that. Um, every year, uh, often in association uh, in partnership with the, uh, the Day Worker Center of Mountain View, on Martin Luther King Day, we organize a uh, day of service, and that involves a neighborhood cleanup project. So 
along with folks at the day worker center, um, uh, we and our neighbors uh, go around and pick up a lot of trash in the neighborhood. Uh, sometimes on Mother's Day, we um, have a sidewalk chalk art uh, activity. This was um, particularly true during the pandemic period when we couldn't organize face-to-face -face gatherings. And so we're looking for activities that people could do independently, but still engender some sense of community activity. More on the um, issue side of our activities, we have recently um, organized, conducted candidate forums in the election years, um, having the various city council candidates participate and then another forum for school board candidates. And we'll be doing so again in the next election cycle. And lastly, the uh, Neighborhood Association works closely with the local community emergency response team to promote neighborhood involvement in that volunteer activity, which is uh, sponsored by the uh, fire department and the Office of Emergency Services. So I'll show some images of the more recent of these events. In October, we had our annual general meeting which is a stipulation of our bylaws. Uh, here we see the mayor and vice mayor and members of the community. Um, this so happened coincidentally to be the one day <laughs> of rain, I think uh, in that entire month, the day of the atmospheric river you might remember, but uh, that, that did not dissuade neighbors from coming out and enjoying the activities. It was near the Halloween time frame, so we themed the, the general meeting in a Halloween uh, a theme. At the annual general meeting, we uh, review our neighborhood budget plan and elect new officers. Then in December, we had our holiday lighting ceremony in Mariposa Park, and this is a image of the folks that showed up and, and uh, lighting work that we produced. And then in January, uh, uh, this year's edition of the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, Day of Service with folks from the neighborhood and the Day Worker Center all picking up lots of trash. So as Nick mentioned, our upcoming event is tomorrow. If you're, if you're viewing this live, it's tomorrow. If you're watching a recording, you probably missed it. But uh, I invite everyone to join us tomorrow from two to four in Mariposa Park for our ice cream social. We won't actually be serving ice cream. This year we have the Kona ice uh, mini truck coming. We'll be doing shaved ice. There'll be 20 some odd flavors that you can choose from. So we encourage the community to come uh, visit uh, Mariposa Park, meet your Shoreline West neighbors, have a refreshment and enjoy the company of the community. Um, lastly, just a few of the communications vehicles for the association. Uh, the SWAN website is shorelinewestmd.com. We have content in both English and Spanish that covers events, activities, information about the association. Um, generally quarterly, but because we have a lazy editor, it's really whenever we have sufficient content. Uh, we produce the Swan News and uh, welcome you to subscribe to the Swan News by sending us an email at the Swan email, shorelinewestmd at gmail.com. And we have another mail list for Silly in the Street for the, uh, the various block parties at Silly in the Street. So please contact us if you want to be included on communication lists or invited to the upcoming events. We invite everyone in the neighborhood to, to participate. Uh, we have a steering committee and we have some openings on the steering committee. So I, I really encourage people that are interested in the neighborhood to volunteer, uh, send a note to the email and, and we'll get you uh, involved in coordinating our activities. So uh, please volunteer or get on the mailing list or check out the website, um, talk to your neighbors. If you're interested in the CERT team, uh, I encourage you to join that.
and let us know of any issues or ideas you have uh, for helping to continue to improve and uh, grow our neighborhood. With that, I thank you for your time and I, uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow in Mariposa Park, if you can join us. Great. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for the invitation. I'm sure some of us will take you up on the author. It's nice that you uh, will allow other folks from other neighborhoods. And speaking of neighborhoods, uh, this is just, an, uh, to me, is an exciting demonstration of the community that um, Mountain View has formed. We have lots of neighborhoods, and it's so exciting to see um, neighbors coming together, connecting with CERT, um, exploring our history. It's, it, to me, it's a great demonstration of the community of Mountain View. So I have um, maybe some questions from the audience. I have a, a question that I would like to pose to Nick. Um, as you know, I sort of became a suffrage um, research freak about what happened in Mountain View when women in California um, uh, fought for the vote for many, many years. But one of the things that uh, happened uh, was Mountain View was the only city around that allowed um, alcohol. Mayfield was dry, Palo Alto was dry, um, Los Altos was dry, Sunnyvale was dry. So I think it's sort of interesting, and that didn't change until 1911 after women got the vote. Um, so I think it's sort of interesting that the Seventh-day Adventists would still come to a community where there were seven, seven saloons. Um, so if a person wanted to drink, you came to the little burg of um, Mountain View. So how do you think that the Seventh-day Adventist organization was able to reconcile that with the decision to, to move here? That's a, a great question. I don't know the answer to, but um, maybe it has something to do with the city council kind of courting them at the time and the town being newly established. Uh, there was an opportunity and an offer and they were looking for someplace more rural. And, you know, like you said, a few years later after they moved, then there was prohibition. So it became a, a moot point pretty quickly, at least for the decade that that was an act. Okay. Someone said that their mother's grandmother's family moved to Mountain View in 1904. Uh, as wow. Seventh-day Adventist family. So, so obviously it was a good choice, uh, a good opportunity, even though they suffered substantial damage in the 1906 earthquake and shortly thereafter the fire. Um, and to their credit, they decided to stick it out in Mountain View. So I'm sure the city was very appreciative and we are to have a wonderful neighborhood that was uh, created by this uh, company. Um, and as Harvey says, free land, of course, no, what's wrong? What don't you understand about free? Um, <laughs> So does anyone else have any, we have some chat questions. Uh, Nick, do you want to go look at them and I'll look them also? Uh, saw that Robert Cox had raised his hand. So I don't know if he had a question. Um, we could try to unmute him. Robert, you, you should be able to talk now. Oh, good. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Okay, thanks very much for the great talks on both ends. Um, first, Nick, you know, in terms of enlightening me even more about the history of Shoreline West and also uh, Jonathan. We recently had two post-COVID events in our neighborhood. I'm vice chair of the Old Mountain View Neighborhood Association. And somebody wrote me a letter and said, this is great. You guys are getting more like Shoreline West in your spirit of community. <laughs> so so uh, they, she said, you know, pay close attention to what they're doing in their events. And so, I mean, I took notes while you put your slides up. I just want to let you know that. Uh, my question is back to uh, Nick. Uh, you had talked about, you know, how the founding of Mariposa Park and, you know, I mean, that, that, that uh, result in the eviction of your neighbors. I was wondering, I mean, did they sell their properties voluntarily to the city or um, did they, were the properties taken by eminent domain or how did that happen? The property was voluntarily sold to the city, but it had been rented out by a long for a long, long time. Um, so it was all there was uh -huh. a there was a complex of cottages. So the barn had been converted into a cottage, and there I think there were at least other three other cottages, and then a house fronting on Mariposa, and then the Victorian that I showed a picture of uh, by that time had been subdivided into a separate lot. 
Um, mm -hmm. And so the people living in the rentals were all evicted. The city oh, bought that parcel first. And mm -hmm. then um, the neighbors kind of got worried about an L-shaped park, like with mm -hmm. a West Dana dead ending into it and kind of said, you know, if we're going to do this, it'd be really nice if it was, you know, an actual rectangle with good visibility on both sides. And so the city uh, then purchased the Little Victorian, which it kind of, you know, for, from a preservation standpoint, that was a bit of a bummer that got knocked down. And from a park design standpoint, it really helped the, the design of the park and I think safety too. I see, I see that. So that's the thing I was missing that they were evicted because they weren't the owners of the property. When right. The Got it. Thanks for clarifying that. Sure, great question. Do we have any other questions? Robert, maybe you could lower your hand. Um, and we can take his screen share. Or... Well, I'd also offer, uh, I think we have some folks who lived in the neighborhood for a long time um if anyone is interested i can we can unmute you if you want to share any of your memories we have a few minutes left before this ends and it'd be nice to to hear other folks memories of the neighborhoods if you are willing no pressure but maybe i'll give you know a few seconds to see if anyone jumps at the opportunity and nick was breaking up a little bit so i think he was opening the forum to anyone who would like to make any comments So I don't see any other comments. Um, Nick, was there something that you wanted to include in your presentation, but you thought, hmm, I don't know if I want to include that. Was there anything that you thought would be of limited interest or some little weird factoid? Uh, I, if I had more time, I would have scanned one of the, like the early Swan newsletters um, because the, the formation of Swan was really uh, spurred by the desire by the neighborhood to preserve the backyards that had been, uh, um, you know, the houses had been removed off of Bailey and the backyards remained and those lots are just kind of sitting there and the city had decided they wanted to sell them or develop them and Swan formed because uh, the neighbors thought there was no Mariposa Park at the time um, and there was very little public open space that served the neighborhood. So there was a, a push to preserve that and that's why the neighborhood's name um, is Shoreline West because it was kind of focused on, on those parcels. Um, I always think it's a little bit funny that the neighborhood's name is Shoreline West though, uh, because it's like, you know, it's nowhere near Shoreline or Shoreline Amphitheater. The road isn't, you know, the road goes to the shoreline, but it's just kind of like, yeah, but it, it's, it's the historic name now. It's been the name since the nineties, which is hard to believe it was, you know, 30 years ago, but um, you know, it has such a rich history and Shoreline West sounds like something that was only a neighborhood that maybe only came about, you know, in the 1980s or something. Um, there's a couple comments in the um, chat. Nick, yeah. you want to look at them? I don't know. Yeah, Betsy, I would be great if you want to chat. I'm going to allow you to talk if you don't mind and, and be great to hear your voice again. It's been a long time. So you are now uh, able to speak if you want to unmute. Yes, it's very nice to, to see you and to see all that you guys have done to the neighborhood. I, I knew you when you were just a kid. I didn't even know if you were in He school. still is. Yeah, he still is. <laughs> and your mom and, oh, anyway. Um, so I just thought it would be interesting, maybe. I, I We lived for 30 years where, in the house where Jonathan now lives and on Mariposa. And when we were looking to buy it, um, we heard about the house that would be going up for sale from a member of the city council. And so we never went to a realtor. We went to the Woolards who were, um, he was the head of Pacific Press and the family was moving back east to where the press was relocated. I, I, don't, I don't remember it being Idaho or wherever it was. I thought it was further east, but anyway, they were leaving. And so uh, we had a, uh, our son was young. And so I was at home and my husband said, well, why don't you just call around and see what loans we could get on the house? Um, the house was on the market for $60,000 um, at that beautiful home. That's now such a gem. Um, and so I started doing that and every single bank 
said, I'm sorry, no, we don't loan in that area. Now at the time, it was in the part was in the county and there weren't sidewalks on Mercy on our block. So there was an assessment going through to do that, but they wouldn't loan. And, and there were various reasons. One was, um, no, they didn't loan in the neighborhood because it was a transitional neighborhood. Mixed use, people came and go, went. Um, that was one reason. Another one, Wells Fargo said they were sorry, but they only currently lent on um, where there was attached garages. Um, and this garage was not attached. Bank of America said, well, they would loan, but for higher points. Um, and so we asked for a loan less than the value of the, the, just for the value of the land. And still we couldn't get it. So the city council got involved in that, sent letters to all the banks. The, the state got involved in it. And um, all of a sudden, because of certain things that happened, uh, every bank was very willing to give us a loan. And, um, but it was instructive about how people viewed an old neighborhood. Now, of course, old neighborhoods are the gem of a community. But back then, that was not, that was back in the uh, 70s, was not true. So it's just an interesting, I don't think it would have been true if we had gone through a realtor, but we were doing this on our own. And I think they could tell me as a woman who didn't know very much on the phone, or that's what they thought, um, that probably wouldn't have happened, but still, it's part of the history. Thank you that's for fascinating. sharing that story. Thank you. Uh, I was just gonna say in response to that, that um, we are, the Historical Association is partnering with the Human Relations Commission on an event uh, focused on housing discrimination in Mountain View. Um, both the good and the bad. Um, and Betsy, it'd be great to connect you to Ida Rose, one of our board members who's helping organize that. And I would love that. I did respond to their questionnaire. Oh, so great. It might, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. It, it still would be good though to get the two of you hooked up because you can, you can speak in first person rather than something that maybe somebody thought happened in the past. Yours sure. is directly a first person experience. Sure. sure. That'd be good. Okay, uh, what else do we have in the chat? Um, or you are taking care of somebody who wants to give us some material. Okay, um, if we don't have any other questions uh, or any other comments, um, Jonathan, do you wanna say anything last? Um, I, I have a question for you, Jonathan. Do they make chocolate flavored shave ice? <laughs> I'll have to go on the website and confirm, but they'll have something pretty close if they don't have that. I don't know how you get up 29 flavors without having chocolate be one of them. So. Yeah, I don't know, chocolate and ice together. But anyway, um, <laughs> so yes. So members of the Mountain View Historical Association will be there tomorrow. Uh, we'll be answering any questions. Uh, Nick's not going to be joining us, are you? I will. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. So then <laughs> Then I don't have to make up any answers. And say, like, I know what I'm talking about. I've got some old neighbors I got to see. So come say hi. Great. Right. Okay. Then we'll see you later. tomorrow. Uh, so Jonathan, you have any last words? No, just thanks so much for the invitation. And I uh, really appreciate uh, the Historical Association's work and preserving our, our history and all uh, Nick's scholarship. Uh, I think he's kind of dedicated his life to preserving Mountain View's story. So. Thanks. Thanks to you. Uh, what would we do without uh, Nick? Um, <laughs> great. Yes. Yeah, Nick is very awesome. Nice, but it's fun to share with everyone. So thanks for everyone for coming today and listening to yeah. us talk and looking forward to seeing many of you tomorrow. Okay, great. Well, then we'll end our uh, presentation. Our next event will be in August. Uh, we haven't quite worked out what that will be. Historically, it's an ice cream social. Uh, Thank but you. Um, but we're still working that out. We're hoping there won't be any new variants. So watch our space um, for our next event. And our newsletter also will be coming out probably about mid-July, our next issue. We have one more thing in chat. Oh, a thank you. Yes. Well, again, thank you, Nick. All right. Uh, goodbye, everyone. And have a nice rest of your afternoon and the weekend. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.